Okay, uh, everybody, welcome to our event, Shifting Sands, Disability and Reasonable Accommodations in the COVID, post-COVID higher education environment. Uh, that uh, I am Vivian Ratt, I'm the chair of the Trinity College Dublin Forum for Disabled Staff and Postgraduate Students. Uh, this is actually our third annual conference. Uh, and that uh, I would like to note that we have a, a very significant registration here today. And what's really, really uh, great to see is the number of uh, colleges that are represented from all across the college, demonstrating the interest there is in this topic, but also, uh, 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 I suppose, an acknowledgement within the different colleges that this is an important topic to them. What is also great is to, to note is that we actually have a representation here from the UK and some of the UK groups uh, to, to this event. And we actually have uh, James Hill uh, from Cranfield uh, University speaking with us here today, uh, which is really super. Before the event kicks off, uh, what I'd first like to do is to acknowledge the support and work uh, of our group of volunteers who have uh, worked very, very hard to organize this event, all in a voluntary capacity uh, in their own time. And I think it, I always like to do that at the start of the event to ensure that uh, they get the, their due acknowledgement. So I just start like to begin with uh, Patricia McCarthy, uh, who has been who was involved in setting this up when, uh, many years ago now. Uh, and uh, that Patricia has done a huge amount of work over the last couple of weeks, especially when I was away on my holidays. You might notice my panda eyes, uh, that uh, everybody else is too polite to say it. Uh, so, but uh, I, I, whilst I was away, Patricia was in charge of the reins. Uh, Fiona Smith, who will be doing our IT work here today. And unfortunately, Fiona has absconded and is no longer with us here in Trinity uh, and is now in UCD. Uh, and, uh, but she has still remained on to, to, to produce and uh, to work on this event uh, with us uh, today. So thank you, uh, Fiona. And then Sarah, who is away off in the US uh, and has gotten up, uh, uh, is it earlier, Sarah, or later? I'm not quite sure where you are exactly. Uh, I don't know earlier. Yeah, so Sarah has made a huge effort uh, to be here, and Sarah, thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, that's, uh, that Sarah has Sarah has been with us uh, from the very beginning, and is actually the postgraduate uh, representative here uh, on the forum, and uh, that uh, has made a fantastic contribution. We have Mary Sharp. Mary again has been joins us uh, on a regular basis for our teas and. Uh, that uh, we have regular chats. I'm, I'm a former staff member here in Trinity. Uh, that, um, uh, and thank you, Mary, uh, that, uh, for all your hard work. David is new to the group uh, and he's managed to stick with us. So we're obviously not too bad. Uh, that, uh, and he uh, immediately got involved in our conference organizing committee uh, and has done a power of work. And I'm sure uh, he's, he's enjoying our company too. Uh, so that's our whole uh, organizing uh, team and thank you to all of them for, for all their powerful work. Okay, so now to get into the uh, actual uh, conference. Well, the conference, we, we decided to organize this event uh, in response to a huge amount of questions, uh, but also uh, an underlying uh, concern uh, felt by disabled staff and disabled postgraduates uh, in relation to their rights around reasonable accommodations. Uh, and there was a, a general feeling of a lack of understanding and knowledge around them. And, and there was challenge, challenges being expressed, expressed challenges in actually accessing those uh, reasonable accommodations. But also, of course, and the third thing, this uh, was, was became an even greater concern in the COVID post COVID environment, uh, where many staff, uh, uh, of course, during COVID, everyone was working from home, almost everybody, uh, but the uh, some, some 
there was a requirement for many people to now to return to the workplace. Uh, and so this created a, a higher degree of stress uh, for some disabled people who maybe uh, for different circumstances, autoimmune conditions, etc., uh, were, were concerned about entering a busy, uh, crowded environment. Uh, and had concerns about what their status of reasonable accommodations were at that point. And then, of course, the fourth reason was for those who perhaps have, have acquired a disability, um, maybe have acquired maybe due to uh, aging or perhaps uh, just during normal life course. But then, of course, those people who have acquired who acquired COVID and were left with long COVID. And we're reading more and more and more about uh, people who have acquired long COVID and then uh, have been finding it difficult to attend work or participate in daily life. Uh, as a result of that, uh, that, we felt it was really necessary to, to tackle this issue uh, and to, to support uh, others to, to, about information about it and understanding. And to, to that end, then we decided to organize this event. As I mentioned, this is our third conference. Uh, and our previous conference last year, Ableism in Academia, uh, actually has really set the ball rolling uh, for a discussion around ableism in higher education. Uh, and so we, we do hope that this event uh, will do similarly. Uh, and the plan is to actually produce a conference report uh, and to launch it uh, during International Disability Week uh, in uh, the end of November, beginning of December. Our publication from last year was very, very successful. And the group actually only recently pre presented to the Quality Authority, uh, Higher Education Quality Authority in Austria uh, with the support of QQI um, uh, to, to discuss these issues to ensure that disabled people and ableism was also considered uh, during the quality reviews, but also in ensuring that reviewers were included. But now back to this event, as I mentioned, uh, our team are going to work to bring together a report and some recommendations uh, for this event based on the panel discussion uh, and the breakout rooms, but also our keynote uh, presenter. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure, Patricia, has Gareth arrived in yet? won't see him there. Okay, well, that's, that gives me a, more of an opportunity uh, to talk then. The really, in terms of the forum, the idea of the establishment of the forum uh, was in Trinity, was to ensure that disabled people uh, had a voice uh, in, in the college uh, and also to establish a structure uh, to ensure uh, that that voice came from right from the ground up, but also to ensure that decisions at the top uh, what, what came back down to, the, to, to those on the ground. So that top up bottom down structure uh, was very necessary. Uh, and, and we have worked to do that uh, through establishing structures uh, such as firstly our forum, but then uh, the Equality Committee set up a subgroup, which was a staff uh, network group, which worked focused on specific issues. Um, and then, of course, the final piece of that, of course, was the establishment of a GSU disability officer, which is our own Sarah. Uh, and of course, then the disability service set up a fourth level um, a position there to actually focus on postgraduate issues. But I now see uh, Gareth has arrived. Uh, Gareth, thank you for joining us. Uh, better late than never, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> well, absolutely, you can be sure. Well, Gareth, you're very lucky because I'm prone to talking, so you gave me an opportunity to talk a little bit more. Uh, so uh, Gareth Noble, uh, who many of you I'm sure will know, is a Trinity College Dublin alumnus and a partner in KOD Lines Solicitors with expert in uh, disability law, carers law, children's rights, uh, uh, judicial reviews and public interest. Um, he is currently, I believe, over in the West, uh, arguing the case. Uh, and we're really delighted to have him here today. Uh, Gareth, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us to discuss this very important topic. Um, I'm going to let you take over now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And apologies to everybody for my late arrival. I'm down here in, in uh, Castlebar for the next few days uh, in relation to children in care cases. So I've hot-footed it upstairs. 
Uh, I'm slightly out of breath, but I'm here and I'm, I'm delighted always to be here. Uh, uh, and uh, particularly, as Vivian has said, as a, as a former graduate of Trinity College, albeit uh, as every year passes, uh, uh, it becomes slightly more of a distant memory, but it's always a, a particular pleasure to, uh, to, to have continued engagement with Trinity and with you all. Uh, when Vivian was uh, issuing this invitation to me um, and sent me the title of the proceedings, uh, it was uh, uh, the title being Shifting Sands, Disability and Reasonable Accommodation in the COVID, post-COVID higher educational environment. And I really think that perhaps the, the key words in that is this whole idea of it being a shifting sands because uh, the world has utterly changed uh, in the last number of years and uh, no more so uh, as we emerge from that. Uh, oh, uh, unknown unknowns was always the phrase that we had, and we can never rule out or exclude the possibility that uh, further uh, 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 strains of COVID-19 might change everything once again. And so therefore this whole idea of shifting sands, I think is, is very important as we, as we plan or we map out uh, what our educational systems, including higher education, looks like. And really, I guess, in terms of reasonable accommodations uh, in a post-COVID environment, you know, we're actually, actually looking here at participation because reasonable accommodations are those steps and measures that can be taken that enable participation. Uh, and reasonable accommodations, even as a phrase, uh, is somewhat uh, uh, vague, uh, it, it can sometimes be a, a little bit unenforceable. And fundamentally, what it is about is enabling people to participate in higher education. Um, uh, and in terms, therefore, of, 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 of awareness around that, I think the group, uh, and as I was coming on, I heard Vivian speak about uh, various steps that Trinity are taking and, and groups and so on that I'll talk about a little bit in, the, in a moment. Uh, but it is also around a proper discussion, uh, proper consultation, um, hearing the views and concerns of everybody, but also understanding that it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, uh, approach either. That, it, and that a reasonable accommodation is very different dependent on the person involved uh, and I think going forward, it is that flexibility within any system uh, that is important. And so what might work, work for one person may not work for another. Uh, and it's about trying to capture uh, and, 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 and lead on uh, that participatory framework uh, with sufficient flexibility to make it about the needs of that person rather than about the needs of a category of people or subgroup or whatever, or whatever the case might be. Um, the United Nations did a policy brief which was uh, entitled Education During COVID-19 and Beyond, uh, and that was published in August 2020, um, and that stated that the COVID-19 pandemic has created the largest disruption of education systems in history, and it affected, when we look at it, nearly 1.6 billion learners in more than 190 countries and across all continents. So that's, that is our starting point. That disruption has resulted in this mass disorientation across our educational systems, and that that requires in itself participants and systems to reorientate uh, in a world which was transformed, as I say, by COVID-19. And while there's been a lot of discussion and coverage uh, on the effects of the pandemic on business and social care, there's probably been far less scrutiny of how working and school age disabled people have been affected. Uh, and uh, therefore it is opportunities like today that provide uh, an opportunity for some analysis on the rights of people with disabilities to access these reasonable accommodations throughout Irish higher education. And from a legal perspective, uh, the constitution of course provides for education that is suitable and appropriate for children of school going age. Uh, 
um, uh, and is very silent on, 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 on post-18 provision and on higher educational provision. So when we are looking at the whole concept of reasonable accommodations in a higher educational setting, we do so really through the, the lens, if you like, of occupational health and uh, safety uh, and in the context of equality legislation. And we know that in some sectors there were clear trends, and I say trends because, because this is all a work in progress, but in some sectors there were clear trends which in, indicated increased risks of transmission of COVID-19. And that was notable in the service and sales sectors, in cleaning, uh, in domestic work, in ed among education workers, in meat processing, in hospitality, in drivers and transportation, in public safety workers, in construction workers, and people in social service occupations. Workplaces with physical person-to-person -person contact, workplaces that had inadequate ventilation, common eating areas, shared work accommodations and travel were all more likely to report COVID-19 outbreaks. And higher education learning environments in particular fall under that higher workplace risk level. And that's not me saying it, it's the WHO saying it. Um, and uh, they define medium risk categories as being those workplaces with jobs or tasks with frequent contact between people, uh, but do not require contact with people who are known to be infected with COVID-19. Uh, and higher educational environments, by their very nature, have a high potential for close contact with people in the community who may be suspected of being infected with COVID-19, and obviously, uh, of course, contact with objects and surfaces uh, possibly contaminated with the virus. So it is highly relevant in terms of the, the very environment that a higher educational place uh, 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 brings. Um, and when we look at reasonable accommodations, that term it does arise in terms of equality legislation and under the Equal Status Act, uh, it is prohibited to discriminate in the provision of goods and services, in the provision of accommodation, and also crucially for today's purposes in access to education. And one of the nine grounds which outlaw discrimination is the disability ground. And what the Employment Equality Acts oblige employers to do is to make reasonable accommodation for people with disabilities. And that includes people with physical, intellectual, learning, cognitive or emotional disabilities and a range of medical conditions. And section 16 of the Employment uh, Equality Act requires an employer to take what are referred to as appropriate measures to facilitate people with disabilities in accessing and participating in employment and in educational services, unless those particular measures that are being sought would impose a disproportionate burden on the employer. And that therefore means that there is an onus on employers or workplaces to make arrangements that will enable a person with a disability to have equal opportunities when applying for work, to be treated the same as co-workers, to have equal opportunities for promotion and to be able to undertake training. There is no list uh, of what reasonable accommodations are. There's not an exhaustive list. And as I say, that comes back to the seeking of the particular measure in place, the rationale for it. Uh, and therefore there is an obligation then on an employer uh, to proactively uh, assess that. Uh, and to make that reasonable accommodation, unless uh, in doing so would uh, bring about a, um, a disproportionate burden on the employer. In 2019, prior to COVID, the Supreme Court established certain key principles in this area of disability discrimination law in the landmark case of Daly versus Nano Nagel School. And that case centered on Miss Daly, who was a special needs assistant who had worked in this uh, school 
for children with uh, mild to profound learning disabilities, and she'd worked there since 1998. And in 2010, she had a serious accident following which she was paralyzed and had to uh, use a wheelchair. And after a period of extensive rehabilitation, she uh, sought to return to work. And following a review, the school board concluded that Ms. Daly did not have the capacity to undertake the full set of duties associated with being a special needs assistant, nor would she in the future. And so they decided not to permit her to return to work. And obviously this is a case which went through the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and ended up in the Supreme Court. And obviously for the purposes of today, I'm just looking at what the Supreme Court's key points were. And the Supreme Court broadened the scope of an employer's reasonable accommodation obligation by stating that there was no reason why providing reasonable accommodation should not involve a redistribution of what might be termed core duties as well as non-core tasks. And the Supreme Court made it clear that an employer must consider potential actions concerning both duties and tasks in discharging its reasonable accommodation obligations. And that completely overturned the Court of Appeals approach to this issue, which in essence held that an employer was only required to consider a distribution of non-core tasks and didn't need to consider the whole elimination or redistribution of core duties of an employer. But notwithstanding that significant change, most, much of the reasonable accommodation test remains the same, the same. And that is one that is easy to state, uh, but perhaps more difficult to apply in, in, in practice. Uh, and so therefore what the Supreme Court reminds us is that an employer is under a mandatory duty to take all appropriate measures irrespective of whether that involves core duties or non-core tasks, unless any measure would constitute a disproportionate burden for the employer. And the employer must demonstrate that they have fully considered the reasonable accommodation question. The Supreme Court in particular noted that the test is one of reasonableness and proportionality. An employer cannot be under a duty entirely to redesignate or create a, diff a different job to facilitate an employee, as that would almost inevitably impose a disproportionate burden on an employer. The Supreme Court did confirm that an employer has no binding legal obligation to consult with an employee or to allow them to participate in the process of they themselves assessing what is or what is not reasonable accommodation. But nonetheless, the Supreme Court did comment uh, that a wise employer will provide meaningful participation in the vindication of his or her duty under the Act, particularly in light of the importance of fair procedures under Irish employment law. The Supreme Court did confirm that an employer is under a mandatory duty to explore the possibility of looking for or obtaining public funding or other assistance when considering all reasonable accommodations which might be put in place. And I'm aware that there are state, this is something that a lot of employers aren't aware of, there are, um, there are certainly a, 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 a public funds that are available for employers uh, to seek to access in terms of discharging that burden. Um, the Supreme Court did acknowledge also that if an employee would not be able to fully undertake the duties of their role, uh, even on the provision of all reasonable accommodation, then there is no discrimination at issue. And in his judgment, Mr. Justice Peter Charlton stated uh, uh, that it is particularly useful to see disability uh, that, sorry, that it is not particularly useful to see disability as being medical in nature. A person with a disability remains a person, an individual with human dignity who is required to be treated as such. That, of course, also ties in with uh, the type of model that we are seeing through the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We were the last EU country uh, to fully bring that in. Uh, and in fact, I would argue, and I know that some of you that I've spoken to uh, about this issue, that remains an incomplete process because of course, uh, in order to bring a complaint about any breach of the UN Convention, Ireland opted out of that protocol, which enabled 
uh, people who were adversely affected by the UN Convention uh, to bring an application or to bring a complaint uh, to the UN system that would uh, determine or adjudicate on such complaints. Um, when we are looking at who is entitled to reasonable accommodations, um, there is a very helpful draft code of practice uh, which was published by the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, IREC. And that set out uh, in that code of practice, the nature and extent of an employer's obligations to provide reasonable accommodation to employees with disabilities. And that code sets out that where needed in a particular case, an employer is legally obliged to provide reasonable accommodation to an employee once they are aware or are on notice of an employee's disability, again, unless that would give rise to a disproportionate burden on the employer. Equally, an employer should increase awareness of the duty to provide reasonable accommodation among their employees and also to foster a work environment where early disclosures of uh, disabilities is encouraged. Uh, that code states also that an employer should uh, consider rolling out a program of disability awareness training to all their employees. Uh, the code outlines that a full assessment of the individual employee must be undertaken, and they recommend that employers in, appoint a, a disability liaison officer, or alternatively ensure sufficient HR expertise is available, uh, and to draft policy uh, covering procedures around disability in the workplace and reasonable accommodations. Employers are also expected to have regard to the principles of universal design when considering reasonable accommodation measures. Uh, uh, taken from the universal design website, they talk about the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. And the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design was established uh, on foot of the Disability Act in 2005, and that introduces a new concept into the consideration of reasonable uh, accommodation measures and isn't something uh, which is considered under the Employment e Equality Acts themselves. Um, and Therefore, when we look at it in the context of COVID-19, uh, in educational places, we're not talking about eliminating the risk uh, of somebody getting COVID-19, but the steps that are reasonable to take to mitigate against those hazards and to protect as best as we can the health, safety and well-being of staff members and, and students in on-campus uh, learning environments. Because we, of course, know about the emerging body of research and evidence of transmissions uh, as being particularly more prevalent in indoor, crowded and inadequately ventilated spaces where people spend long periods of, of time uh, with others. So in terms of your rights around reasonable accommodations, uh, there has been a lot of work done in terms of preventing and mitigating COVID-19 at work. There are comprehensive action points for governments and workplaces in implementing the relevant WHO, World Health Organization and ILO recommendations on COVID-19 and occupational safety and health. There is perhaps more research required and needed in terms of enabling remote participation spaces uh, for research and co-production among disabled people uh, with energy impairment beyond COVID-19 and the whole concept of long COVID and so on and where that all fits in terms of participation uh, in education and in, 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 in higher educational environments. And so therefore what we need to look at is the adoption of, of an inclusive learning model but which uh, perhaps has hybrid aspects to it. Um, and uh, I, I know that the AHEAD group, uh, the Association for Higher Educational Access and Disability, working co in collaboration with uh, the Disability Advisors Working Network, have also published uh, what is known as the Inclusive Education Roadmap. 
and that collaboration has in fact really brought together uh, uh, years of research on the inclusion of students with disabilities in higher education. And they again conclude that an inclusive approach based on the UDL principles uh, would provide an effective framework to include and improve the retention of not only uh, disabled students, but a diverse range of students, including mature students, including migrant students, international students, and students from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, and uh, principally, uh, this is in response to a continuing increase in the number of students with disabilities that are entering higher education in Ireland. Uh, it is also sadly juxtaposed with a decrease in available funding to support such transitions. Uh, but as we emerge from COVID-19, there is uh, a certain opportunity now uh, around retaining a, a, that hybrid uh, element of working. A, I think a much greater understanding around um, the, uh, the, the benefits uh, of uh, uh, hybrid uh, working, uh, the, the benefits of the use of technology in order to ensure the maximum participation possible. We will have our, our, and coming on stream uh, legislation um, from the Department of uh, 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 Business and Trade, uh, Leo Varadkar's current department, around the right to ask your employers to be able to work from home. And although it's not a mandatory um, obligation on employers to do that, there certainly must now be a legal consideration uh, of that aspect of matters. Um, the UN Convention is now upon us. We have IREC, uh, whose work on disability rights has certainly uh, uh, benefited the whole area. We have good research from the WHO and we have the equality legislation that is in place. And of course, if there is a breach of the Equality Acts, uh, there is a process whereby these things are considered by the WRC uh, that also deal with employment uh, more generally. But if you are uh, uh, progressing a claim in respect of reasonable accommodations or being discriminated against on the basis of the nine grounds, one being disability, uh, the appropriate uh, body that examines that is the WRC. It used to be the uh, Equality Commission that was abolished uh, during the last recession uh, and mer its functions merged with um, the WRC. Uh, I also think, and I, I, I'll finish with this, uh, that there is also not only a greater discussion and a greater understanding, but what COVID-19 has demonstrated for us uh, is that uh, in the workplace generally uh, that uh, uh, people with uh, disabilities uh, uh, provide a, a great resource and great benefit to companies and to higher educational settings and so on. Uh, and that uh, COVID-19 has an effect created a new space uh, to uh, enable uh, those with disabilities to play meaningful roles in whatever organization or setting that they are in, in a way that perhaps our systems weren't designed uh, to achieve uh, prior to COVID-19. So it is in those, it is in that context that sessions such as today, increased awareness, perhaps better legislation and uh, more adjudication by courts would perhaps be of benefit, uh, uh, coupled with the research that's ongoing, um, to looking at uh, uh, people being aware of their rights to reasonable accommodations, the challenges associated with uh, accessing those rights post COVID, um, perhaps as Miss Nagel saw, uh, sorry, as, uh, as, uh, as in the Nagel case, the Nagel case, um, the whole area of having acquired a disability and not being sure of your right to access reasonable accommodations. Uh, and, and also greater awareness among employers themselves that they sure have, perhaps shouldn't be waiting, necessarily hiding in a corner um, to, be, to, to be asked that these policies would in fact see a more proactive effort on their part 
to ensure that their policies are uh, not a, not passive in nature, uh, but are in fact proactive and uh, and are in place. And also the whole area of, of uh, I know there is being work done on this, the whole concept of long COVID um, and the acquisition of reasonable accommodations if you have long COVID. There is nothing from a legal perspective that prevents seeking reasonable accommodations when you are and continue to be impacted by long COVID. Um, and uh, also an awareness, of course, that reasonable accommodations are there for people who have long-term contracts, short-term contracts, uh, right across the setting among academic staff, non-academic staff, cleaning staff, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that uh, uh, there is no distinction in law between any of those uh, particular uh, categories. So that's my starting point in terms of uh, 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 the discussion that we're having today. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take any observations or questions in relation to those aspect of matters. Um, it's, 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 it's a very fluid situation, but it's, it's a very exciting situation uh, because we are finally having a very substantive discussion about workplace environments, about higher education environments, and how we can shape and create those spaces to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, Gareth, uh, thank you very much that, for a really insightful uh, presentation. Uh, one aspect there we might ask you is that uh, it might be possible to, to access your notes uh, at some point. Would that be possible or a transcript of, of, of that course. for some of our members? Uh, because there's a huge amount to, uh, to ruminate on there uh, and to digest. Uh, and, and so I think it probably would be useful uh, for people to access them, if, if you don't mind. Would that be okay? I, I can get those to you later in the week. There's no hassle about thank, that. Thank you, Gareth, and thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'm just going to open it out to the floor now um, uh, that's, uh, and to our, our audience. If anybody has any questions, uh, maybe they can either put up their hand uh, or you could put them in the chat box. Um, again, that there's a lot there to digest, so I can understand. I might just start things off, uh, Gareth, um, and I think as well, I, I don't, you might not have time for our panel discussion, um, which probably will throw up a, a whole range of different uh, issues. There's a, a message just in excellent, Garrett, for such a clear and uh, mightful, uh, insightful discussion of the key issues, uh, Michael Shevelin. Um, I, I think there's messages coming in here, Garrett, uh, as fast as I can read them at this point. Uh, so I'll get to them in a second. But, there are a couple of things that really resonate uh, with me as chair of the group uh, of different points that you made that actually come up regularly in general discussion. And I'm going to start actually with one which was about, uh, you mentioned the point, that at what point does the employer become responsible uh, for prov provision of reasonable accommodations? And this actually comes up in another piece of research I was doing uh, earlier on in the year with Ahead, uh, who you've, you've referenced there, and Dawn, actually. But what, at what point, and you mentioned as well about the aware or, or on notice. Could you maybe just give a little bit more about that? Uh, because I think that's often uh, something that's not realized by employers, um, at, 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 that they have a responsibility at that point. Could you maybe give a, a little bit more information on that? Well, I think the right certainly kicks uh, when somebody is on actual notice of it, um, I imagine, you know, that that that, uh, and I don't do uh, a lot of work with in the WRC, but certainly anecdotally, sometimes what we're getting is that if an employer is being, uh, if an employer is before the WRC on the basis of a disability ground, there are often two explanations provided. One is that what is being asked of an employer would create a disproportionate burden on them. And that obviously ties in with the one defense that they have. But secondly, is about the, the, the employer's state of knowledge. 
Uh, so I think from an employee's perspective or from a, from a, from a, from a rights-based perspective, it's a little unclear as to whether or not it is actual knowledge or what we might call constructive notice uh, of, of, uh, of, 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 of what is being needed. I would have thought that the traditional way of looking at it was that the employer's obligation kicks in when they became fully on notice uh, of, uh, of, 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 the, of the issue or the challenge that, 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 that happens and the, the particular request for the particular reasonable accommodation. But I would get a sense that that sort of black and white approach may not always meet the task at hand. I think that there is a growing trend towards the approach that actually, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to sit in the corner and close your eyes until someone sort of knocks you on the head with it. I think that there is going to be over a period of time uh, increased uh, increased um, uh, uh, responsibility on employers to seek this information out themselves uh, rather than wait for it to, to fall on their lap. Um, but certainly from certainly the, the, the case law that is in this area doesn't definitively answer that question other than to say, you know, Certainly, when an employer is brought to an employer's attention, that is most definitely when the obligation kicks in. And there has to be a decision, obviously, about the reasonable accommodations. But I imagine a situation in which someone, for example, comes into a workplace. Uh, you know, isn't that the time to, when, you're, when you're looking at the profile of the employee? Uh, you know, when we all go into a workplace, we're assigned a space of work. That's your desk, that's your computer, that's your mobile phone, there's your car lines, here's your HR policies. Isn't it at that particular point in time that we need to be having the discussions around reasonable accommodations rather than, uh, as I say, uh, closing your ears or eyes to a situation and effectively <laughs> Put, placing an onus or a burden on the employee mm -hmm. to to do the employer's job for them. Yeah. Now, and and of course, one obvious issue uh, which is reported regularly from our members and from across the country is that uh, some disabled people are nervous about disclosing their disability for fear of negative perceptions, um, attitudes, uh, and then and you mentioned this actually about. Uh, continuous professional development uh, opportunities and opportunities to to rise in the ranks uh, uh, concerns about all of that but I'll come back to that now in a second I see there's more messages in I'm just going to take them now uh, Mags, Mags Ammond here says that thank you for such an informative presentation so well explained Garrett it seems uh, ironic that that as positive legislation increases guarantees of increased or even sufficient funding decreases uh, and that's obviously a concern. Uh, Jenny Duffy says, it would be brilliant to see those notes. Thank you, excellent discussion. Thank you, Gareth. How can we encourage disclosure of disability among staff in the university? I do, uh, do, you, do you want to take that, Gareth? As just a- I'm probably the least qualified person <laughs> because I do think that that's, a lot of it is, we know, and you've touched on it as well, Vivian, there. A lot of this is around a culture, isn't it? It's a cultural mm -hmm. mind. It's about creating that safe space where we don't have to think about these things. Yeah. Where is this almost, uh, I mean, we call it, uh, you know, soft, uh, soft exclusion almost, where it, it's not said, uh, but, it, but there is that fear, obviously, about, you know, does the disclosure of my disability or, or the need for me to do X, Y, or Z during the working day, does that inhibit my opportunity to get that post? Will I be, will I be treated differently? And in terms of, does it create the whole, um, uh, does it limit my potential for uh, uh, promotional opportunities or opportunities within the university or wherever the setting is? Mm -hmm. Um, though, uh, those are things about developing a culture of inclusion 
and it, you can have the best i often say this in a lot of courts as well as talks you can have the best individual education plan for a student uh, you know beautifully laminated beautifully color printed and so on but it's only as good as its implementation mm. uh, you and i would have dealt with a lot of different educational settings for example where you know everything's on the back of the envelope everything isn't really written down but they get it done because there is that there is just that can do attitude so that can be very difficult to legislate for that's where your awareness and your advocacy and your positive promotion of the benefit to an organization of including that person that's where that comes in so mm-hmm. The more steps and discussions that can take place and the, and the sense as well of I meet so many people, whether they're carers or they're, um, they're students or they're uh, uh, disabled, uh, uh, disabled people who, who, who often say to me, it's the feeling that I'm really isolated and on my own. And it's, I think, it's organisations such as your own and workplaces such as your own, where it is that feeling of greater solidarity um that gives people that extra bit of confidence because a lot of it is a confidence issue as we all know uh that 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 it gives them that confidence to be able to go together as a group or as an individual to say this is what would make a really good place even better Mm -hmm. yeah also in this final observation i think also there is a lot of unnecessary negative around this whole discussion and debate and what i'm seeing in more recent times and on the back of COVID-19 in fact is a much more positive discussion about inclusion it's a much more positive uh, I, I was at a talk in Galway just after COVID and there was just amazing discussions from the floor in particular about promoting the positive benefits of disabled people in workplace environments and that there isn't enough talked about that <laughs> and, and promoted, uh, promoted in that area. And that, that is something that all of us uh, have work to do in terms of capturing, particularly in the area of hard-nosed business. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I know you're, you're getting tight on time now. I have still two questions in. James has been waiting for forever. Uh, James, uh, James is from Cranfield uh, University. Uh, James? You... Thanks, Vivian. Thank yeah. you. Hi, hi, Gareth. Yeah, I'm from um, uh, the chair of the Disability Network at Cranfield University in the UK, um, and I ha- had a couple of couple of comments. Thanks a lot for your uh, talk, Gareth. It's it's really great, and I think um, you raised so many good points, uh, bigger picture points about culture, um, and I think um, an awareness as well. It's so important, and kind of at Cranfield we talk about going beyond compliance so not just as you as you kind of discussed um not just looking at what's what's required uh two two really specific quick, quick points just on on um, what was just being discussed uh Vivian I wanted to mention to you a discussion that we recently had um around with some other network leaders around that your question about the point when um law, uh where employers have become aware of people being disabled um and we heard from a couple of other network leaders that um, their members had actually told them or they told the networks that they were disabled or had had a disability and they had assumed that, that also meant that their um, employer then knew so we it, we were talking about term, our terms of reference uh, at that time so something there just to kind of mention we, we can talk about that more if you'd like to I wanted to just ask as well Gav, the, the specific question around in the UK I think there's a there's a difference between I'm, I'm definitely not a, any kind of legal expert but I wanted to check around um, anticipatory duty so in the UK for service providers under the Equality Act there's an anticipatory duty um, so that relates to our students, obviously, within higher education. Um, I wanted to check with, is it the same in Ireland? Um, and also, how how should employers look to deal, to deal with that as well? And, and that distinction, because I think there's often a lot of confusion. I see it myself at Cranfield um, with, with line managers and student support teams and, and HR teams around, um, uh, around uh, the distinction between anticipatory duty um, and looking at what needs to be done in advance and go back to your point about being proactive as well. I just wondered uh, if you had any thoughts on that. And is that, is that a distinction in Ireland as well? There isn't, to answer the question very bluntly, there isn't an anticipatory duty expressly provided for in our equality legislation. Um, but 
what our case law tells us and what our decisions tell us is that when an employer is faced with a particular situation that has them either before a tribunal or a, or a complaints body, it's about reasonable foreseeability. So uh, in some respects, implied within that is that the employer has uh, a positive duty, if you want to put it like that way, to ensure that the systems that they have in place uh, reasonably meet the standard that is required and if there is a breach in that uh, or if someone in, is being discriminated against either through an act or an omission on the part of the employer uh, was that outcome reasonably foreseen by the employer given the state of knowledge that they had so um, it's not expressly provided for Burr, but this whole idea of, an, of, of anticipating difficulties coming down the line are things that all come within the bundle of reasonable foreseeability, definitely. James, you're okay? I think James is gone. Okay, Gareth, uh, I don't know if you can answer this last question. It's only a very short one. Uh, Siobhan uh, O'Brien Green, our uh, equality officer uh, here in Trinity, is, uh, has noted, is there a role for the health and safety authority too? I know you mentioned the ILO, the WHO, and IREC. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Oh, is there a role? There's a role for everybody as to whether or not they, that <laughs> body wants to take on. Perhaps a question you should ask for them, so I'm going to avoid it. Uh, but look, the, the serious point is that anybody with uh, uh, an interest in this area or should have an interest in this area has to be invited into the discussion because uh, for too long, we've had everybody with their backs to these issues, uh, and, and, and now we need to face it head on. And uh, any group of uh, uh, any group that has any role in our Irish universities or has any role in uh, terms of fostering a greater culture of inclusion should, in my view, have a position on these issues. And the best way to do that is to ask them. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right about that. Uh, that's a, and, and I think that's where uh, th there is a still a, a quite a significant gap across higher education in terms of employees, uh, that there isn't a culture and history of employee, disabled employee resource groups uh, across the, the, the colleges, and there isn't a history of supporting that either. Um, and so uh, that there's a lot of work, I think, to be done in terms of pre preparing, but um, establishing structures to allow that voice uh, to, to reach those decision makers, uh, Gareth. And, and I think that's a point that was raised at our Ableism in Academia conference uh, as well there last year. Uh, so look, I, I am conscious now that uh, we've taken an, enough of your time and we really do appreciate uh, you, you giving us so generously uh, and uh, that the conversation was really fantastic. Uh, that. Um, I see an, another note coming in. Thanks a million, uh, uh, Garrett, organizers, and everybody here present, uh, present for this brilliant event. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's it. So we're going to continue on now for uh, another while. We have a, a, a lineup of great uh, the panelists uh, for our discussion uh, who will talk about the lived experience. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, we look forward maybe, Garrett, maybe to having you back sometime in the future. Thank you, and best of luck with the rest of the day. I saw the panel, and they're uh, they're 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 very good. Yes, thank you very much, Gareth. Okay, thank you. Bye 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 bye. Okay, uh, so we'll now move on to our panel discussion. Uh, that uh, our panelists uh, come from all over the country, uh, and and we will uh, we have Dr. Deirdre O'Connor, who's chair of the Staff Disability Committee in UCD. We've got Dr. Rebecca Maguire, uh, Department of Psychology in Minute University. We've got James Hill, who's the chair of the Cranfield Disability Network in Cranfield University in the UK. And of course, James also, as, as well as that, is a uh, communications manager there, I think. Um, and then, of course, we have Gerard Gallagher, uh, a deputy director of the Trinity College Dublin Disability Service. And of course, a, a, a member of our own forum here today. Uh, so uh, that uh, I'm just going to uh, spotlight uh, uh, to the, our speakers now uh, for our panel discussion. Uh, that um, and uh, I'll start asking them all the hard questions. Jared, maybe uh, you could just start us off there uh, with 
uh, uh, what are your initial thoughts having heard uh, Garrett's presentation today, both as a disabled person, as a disabled employee, uh, but I suppose also in your role uh, in uh, Trinity here? Sure, and I think it was a really um, fantastic and thought-provoking presentation, certainly from my perspective as a disabled staff member. It's always very useful to be reminded of our rights and employers' uh, obligations to provide reasonable accommodations. The first thing probably that, that I thought about from today's discussion was the legal aspect of it, certainly, but also the importance of a positive culture around disclosure and how it's so important um, that staff see, feel uh, supported and empowered to make um, disclosures of their disability and to, to relook at maybe how they can be supported. I, I suppose the other thing that, that I was sort of reflecting on in, in listening to Garrett's presentation there today was maybe how important it is for disabled staff members to uh, allow their um, supports and accommodations to be revised or reconsidered as their employment changes within an institution and maybe how, how as their role changes, differences in how reasonable accommodations that were in place might, might need to be um, put in place. From a student perspective, um, I think one of the really uh, interesting things post-COVID is students now have a different expectation on what is required um, by universities. For example, the provision of recorded lecture material is something that I think um, students are beginning to expect. And I know um, institution Trinity and other institutions are working with academic staff where possible to make recordings of lectures um, accessible and available to students as one example of, of one of the benefits of, of COVID. And I think um, students are, are going to become more outspoken about that over the next uh, little while, and, and rightly so. And that's maybe going to challenge, um, challenge some um, members of the higher education community who some people would still maybe want to go back to the way things always were. And, and so, um, yeah, a really, really exciting um, presentation today and I look forward to further discussion. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, uh, Deirdre, what, what would your take home uh, be from the presentation today? Thanks, Vivian. And, and first of all, just well done to everybody in, involved for pulling together such a, an, an impressive event and really great speaker. And, you know, I, I learned, I suppose you think if you've a lived experience of this and you've some role in it, you know, you, you always have so much more to learn, you know, and, and, and somebody like uh, Gareth Jay is just a, a real um, example of that. Um, so I suppose, you know, just in terms of, you know, what were the kind of the key things for me from and relating to kind of the first question, I, I think you were going to ask us is, you know, what, what would we kind of really um, prioritize in terms of uh, Gareth's contribution? You know, I think just the whole, um, focus really on on the complexity and, and like it's a very very big task for for managers or for you know senior colleagues in, in the universities does does you know we're struck in UCG as well when we kind of ask managers or staff a, a, about this like there really is a very low level of awareness there about the you know the the um onus if you like on on managers and you know colleagues within the university to what they need to do in terms of of supporting staff and providing reasonable accommodations you know and i think gareth brought home that quite strongly like there's there's a, a fairly serious onus and a very kind of a, a you know a very wide range um, across the, the disability spectrum, you know, what actually constitutes a uh, disability, you know, what should people know, uh, when do they know it, all, all of those things. So I, and it's something I'm kind of very conscious of because we just recently 
explored the idea of disability awareness training for managers in, in UCD and were in the process of getting that underway. So I was kind of quite heartened to, to listen to Gareth talk about, you know, the fantastic work that's underway, say, by IREC and, and, and ahead, of course, uh, have done huge um uh, work in this area. So I, you know, and I think he was also at pains to stress, and I, I really liked this, that obviously the whole kind of legalistic, even medical underpinning of, of all of this is really important. And it is very important because I think you need that architecture and infrastructure, but it's not all about that either. And the whole kind of if you want to call it the softer side, you know, the human and personal dimension of this is, is really important. And while there is that, you know, as I said, whole side that is the responsibility of, of the employer and the, and the university, you know, creating that culture where people with disabilities feel comfortable with disclosure is just so critically important and you can't have one without the other you know you can have all the architecture and all the infrastructure you want but if people don't feel they can engage I, I think that's that's a, a really an, an important um issue and the third kind of takeaway I I really liked and I see Lisa Patton on this call as well is just you know the whole idea of universal design and the fact obviously as an institution, we're becoming more and more familiar with the idea of universal design for learning, you know, and that idea that you try and design systems of learnings that are kind of give flexibility and accessibility for everybody. And, and in that process, then, of course, it, it benefits people with disabilities among every among everything else. But I think even applying just a universal design kind of lens to this is is very useful in the sense that, you know, I, I, I think he mentioned, and I know others have as well, you know, just asking the question of everybody, you know, is there anything we can do to enable you to do your job better? Or is there some accommodation we can make that, you know, enables you to, to function better? You know, so again, I think it speaks to a kind of a cultural shift where you're really trying to accommodate everybody but in the process, you're kind of recognizing that there are going to be people who need more accommodations or different accommodations. So just kind of building that accommodation issue into like a wider discourse of, of, of how people work, um, I think, is a really helpful way of framing. And as I say, it, it's very timely, I think, because I think we have as institutions become much more aware of universal design as it applies to learning. But you know, maybe to a kind of a wider way in which the university functions as well. So they would be my kind of couple of things that really struck me. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Rebecca, I was just thinking there as I was listening to Jared and I was listening to Deirdre and of course, uh, Gareth as well, that, um, you know, that legislation on reasonable accommodations has existed for nearly as long as I'm around. Um, and that the rights of disabled people under the Equal Status Act, um, now in the UNCRPD, um, and uh, that uh, is it. Is there not really a case here that, that there's a, a lot of internalized ableism uh, going on, where we're letting employers off the hook and not actually acknowledging that we have rights, uh, and that saying things like, um, for instance, that we're concerned, you know, employers have a lot to think about, there's a lot of reasonable accommodations, there's different disabilities. But sure, if you go to a shop, people are able to make up their mind and pick what they want, uh, or the people know exactly how to follow their roles in other aspects and other careers, and just feel that, is this not about human rights? Is this not about us standing up for rights? Are we letting employers off the hook? Yeah, no, I think it's a very good point because um, what struck me again about Garth's presentation is it's great to see all the legislative frameworks that are there and as you say, they've existed for many years. But probably what needs to change is more the, the socio-cultural environment, the context um, in which those legislations, you know, they are embedded, they're there, but, but raising awareness, as others have said, is um, very important and the whole concept of universal design of, Deirdre was saying there's there's an awareness of how important that is but is it being put into practice like the you know you know when there's new buildings and new learning spaces being built 
are those principles really being embedded? Um, I think one thing that is interesting again that the whole COVID post COVID are you know argument now. I have very strong views that we're not in the post COVID world. We're not out of COVID and. When we talk about um, the whole idea of risk mitigation, Gart was, was saying, of course, employers during the, the height of the pandemic would have taken steps to mitigate risks for employees. But then there are certain people among us here, and probably Deirdre, you'd be, you'd be the same as me, um, who, because of the medication we're on immunocompromised, that puts us at greater risk. So, you know, are employers actually taking steps to mitigate risks for all the whole principles of universal design? And um, that's just one example that springs to mind. Another thing which Garrett said, I think I think he was quoting from another uh, report, but um, viewing disability as a medical issue isn't necessarily helpful, just viewing a person as a person. Um, and when we think about the concepts of, of burden, um, burden is a very loaded term as well. I mean, we don't really know what, does, what constitutes burden and um, how can we quantify it, but if we focus more on the strength of um, being more inclusive and giving more opportunities for, for people with disabilities to engage in, in higher education, that can be just more of a positive way of framing it. But um, yeah, very, very interesting things. James, uh, you could take a different view and uh, maybe a more of a drone approach where you're looking down on us all here. Uh, but but what has been happening in terms of in the UK on this? I mean, where where does it stand? I think, um, I think, I a lot of the points, I mean, it's, it's very similar, actually, a lot of the points have been, that have been mentioned already. Um, I was I was going to echo what Rebecca just said about the whole post-COVID world. I, I just don't think when I looked at that, the the, the title, the question originally, I thought, are we actually in a post-COVID world? So thousands of people going into their third winter of, um, of, of shielding now. And I think we have to be really careful about that, um, especially with colleagues potentially becoming complacent that things cultures have changed people think actually now there is a there is more flexibility um it's with this culture of presenteeism is being challenged so people don't always have to be in the office but um responding to a health crisis isn't the same as making reasonable adjustments um and all of the things as you were saying all of the requirements all of the things that need to happen probably should have happened 20 30 years ago so I think actually a lot of it, a lot of it has changed. Some things have changed, like like the culture. I think um, the 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 point about adjustments not being the same as well. So the, the different and the complexity of it. I think that's that's absolutely key. I think there's there is more emphasis now on um, dis, uh, staff disability training, but getting that right is absolutely key as well. And the way that the content of that and the way that it's pitched is is absolutely key. I think um, it's we, yeah. We just have to be really careful that that that, that complacency doesn't creep in. So people, I think, just a few from my kind of personal experience that I've seen now, and and the last couple of years, I, I had an occupational health um, assessment myself, um, and there were issues with um, it, it. They stopped doing face to face um, assessments. I don't think that's come back. That's happened again now. It's still they're still doing online assessments, so that throws up issues. I think it's the it's the follow up as well so it's making sure that um line managers are aware i think from what gareth was saying around awareness and information and communication is so important that top-down approach and the role that the networks play like you said earlier on viv um i think um we specific things that we talk about at, at cranfield in our in our network around which we're, we're talking about disability passports or the sometimes referred to as otherwise that that issue of maybe adjustments have been made made but then somebody moves role uh, changes role and they have to go through that whole process again of talking to their new line manager and asking them to uh, uh, you know briefing them on all of that um same with with students if they move to a different module or or start a different course um so i think there are lots of lots of things like that that just we can't take our eye off the ball and we have to be really careful about making sure that people are still being listened to i think that was a big thing at cranfield as well that we found that people just wanted when we we had a discussion about the whole returning to work and i think people just wanted to be listened to and wanted to have that opportunity to discuss how they were feeling um and, and raise that and raise those issues and talk them through and a lot of the time it's like everybody said already 
things can be worked through before you even get to the kind of legal compliance enforcement stage things can be worked through before then and it's about listening to people and talk and, and talking and, and and trying to be as flexible as as possible and i think communication is is absolutely key um one point around re using the word reasonable even i think it gives the impression and although that's the legal term i think it gives the impression that organizations are uncomfortable possibly about having those discussions so in our frontline communications do we even need to say reasonable adjustments can we just talk about sorry accommodations adjustments can we just talk about that and then have the conversation Th those kind of things i think are really important too I'll, mm. I'll stop there i know and i think that's a really good point and i think i know when you joined us for our virtual tea a couple of years ago we were even uh, discussing about the word disclosure do we need i mean I think you use a different term in your college, if I'm right. Yeah, we try to encourage people to talk about sharing or just telling people rather than disclosure or declare or declaring or it's about how we frame disability and the moving away from that de um, narrative of deficit and weakness and um, moving towards more of a, a normalized understanding uh, of, of, of disability. And um, yeah, rather than something that you need to declare like you're on a plane and about to land in a country, filling out a landing form, it's we tr try to use softer language. So talk about sharing, sharing disability. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a really good point. And I think probably some of these issues have arisen uh, because disabled people actually probably weren't involved in coming up with the language in, in the first place uh, around disability, which again, comes back to the points you've all been making around voice uh, and having our voice heard and um, I'm just conscious time is moving quick we could be here all day I think but Jared maybe I'd ask you and I come around to each of you maybe where where to next uh, on this what's what do you think maybe if each each one could give us two points sure well, well I think the most important thing well one of them in anyway certainly visibility visibility of disability on campuses and uh, visibility of difference on campus. For example, in Trinity next week, we're moving to the Disability Hub at Printing House Square and having um, other colleagues who we know have have either are, have dealt with availing of reasonable accommodations in the workplace, but for students in particular, that visibility of seeing what, what's possible is, is so important because um, sometimes when you're making a transition whether it's uh, in employment or in education it can actually be quite an isolating place and in some ways a little bit bit lonely so forums like this i think are, are really important uh, to share experience share expertise there's a second piece that i i would just mention and that is that actually navigating the whole process around reasonable accommodations or adjustment is quite it, it's quite challenging it's quite time consuming or or it can be and so um support around that is 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 essential and 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 time because um i think it's it's not to underestimate the time that I can take um for an employee also i think that's a really good point actually jared in terms of that it's often forgotten the burden i'm using that word burden rebecca uh, the burden of disability administration uh, has for uh, disabled people. And when I say disability administration, I'm talking about the amount of form filling uh, and repeated form filling, uh, often for similar items uh, that disabled people have to put up with on a daily basis. Uh, so I think you probably, uh, you know, I'd agree with you, George, in terms of providing more so support for disabled people in navigating that pro process. Rebecca, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree. The whole idea of form filling and also labeling people as being constrained in certain ways. And, you know, not all disabilities are fixed as well. They can fluctuate. They can vary from time to time. I mean, if you think about the idea of long COVID um, and the experience with something like fatigue. So sometimes fatigue might impose a barrier in certain contexts, but, but not in others. So I think just a, a more nuanced understanding of the complexities of disabilities is um, necessary, but of course that is quite difficult to communicate. So again, raising awareness, raising visibility, something which I probably would not have been comfortable disclosing my disability at an early career stage, but maybe those of us who are further up in the career ladder that are more stable in our um, employment should raise a voice on these issues. 
Um, having more people with disabilities in leadership positions is very important too, because again, we, we've talked a lot about the employer as almost like the employer is this able-bodied person, you know, granting accommodations to the disabled. Well, why, why can't, you know, disabled people be the employers or be at that, the seat of the kind of decision-making table? I think that is incredibly important. Um, and moving forward as well, you know, and as Gareth was touching upon this, we, we shouldn't really lose sight of the advantage that COVID gave in terms of increasing participation. I feel like we are going backwards now. Um, and things like, you know, events, in-person events, conferences. I know Deirdre, you retreated something there about conferences as being quite um constraining environment for disabled academics can put people off. So hybrid options and the like. Um, this is a lot of things we need to do, but hopefully we can become stronger really as a as a community um, in, in lending our voice to these issues. Yeah, I think there's really important points made there as well in terms of uh, accessing, you know, around professional development uh, and opportunities for disabled people to reach those decision making roles. Um, and often that, uh, I mean, my own PhD research found that disabled students uh, found it very challenging to access their roles roles because there was no support or reasonable accommodations being offered uh, to engage in them. Deirdre, uh, your thoughts? Yeah, well, you know, again, very, very similar to the, the speakers be before, but, you know, I think just the kind of the, the bigger picture and all of this is is also about kind of, you know, the precarious position of, of a lot of people in, in academia, you know, and I think it's if, if it's a chat, kind of an overall sectoral challenge it is a, a massive challenge i think for for disabled academics so i think and, and postgraduates because obviously that's the the pipeline so i think you know there is really a, a value in looking at this as part of a, of a of a bigger issue and i know it's beyond the beyond my pay grade certainly but you know certainly and beyond probably the scope of this dis discussion but it is really the that bigger picture that kind of looking at this as as an issue of kind of wider social justice in terms of of you know employment and access to employment and Vivian you and and the work you do you're you're far better equipped to speak to that than me but I think you know that the, the point I'm making um you know and and otherwise I, I know like again from our own discussions in, in UCD here people talk about literally getting kind of training fatigue on work shop fatigue and focus group fatigue and so on but at the same time you know there really has been in our organization a real express need for training and for workshops and for just more information and aware and building that awareness about the issue both from and I take Rebecca's point it's not an us and them but both from you know kind of line managers and also just from you know disabled staff and postgraduate students and themselves, themselves on you know how to have because those conversations are difficult and sensitive and you know and we could have a whole session on why it takes some of us so long to disclose our our disabilities but you know it is a sensitive issue and insofar as you know there is there is a, a kind of a burning um, onus on on the the if you like the manager side and that but there's also the need from the disabled person side to be able to tell their story in a way that that helps them get what what they need so i think notwithstanding the resistance to training and education and all the rest of the moment at we do need it. But having said that, in itself, awareness doesn't change anything. It's kind of translating that into kind of a, you know, cultural shift where people feel seen and heard and there's some kind of action takes place. And I think, you know, that it's not one off, that these are not one off conversations with, I think, those of us with disabilities and with chronic illnesses is a life course thing you know so you're not going to have one conversation and the box is ticked and off everybody goes you know doesn't work like that as, as many of us know um yeah so I suppose that would be kind of my uh, hope really is that you know we we build awareness but we get concrete actions arising from that as I said underpinned by you know, good kind of legislative and medical architecture, if you like, but really putting the person at the at the center of it. Um, but as I say, that we look at it in a kind of a bigger context of, you know, 
precarity in, in employment, um, because I think if it's, if it's an issue for academics generally, it's a much more pressing issue, I think, for academics with disabilities. Absolutely. Uh, James, can I get two brief points uh, uh, that, uh, yeah. and what you think based on your experience? Absolutely. Happening. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I um two two really quick points. I think the overarching thing for me is that it it still needs to go further. In some ways, the uh, pandemic changed a lot, but in other ways, it hasn't really changed very much at all. And I think um, not as I mentioned before, not being complacent about where we are. I think the making sure that there are um, uh, there's still that understanding that accommodations need to be made and there needs to be those discussions having the technology so I think one one key thing as well for me is around hybrid working and, and hybrid teaching as well I'm making sure that we have the t technology infrastructure there seems to be one thing that concerns me is that I, I often, there seems to be sometimes a kind of ideological commitment to trying to get people back face to face and the importance of face to face meetings and the importance on those kind of water cooler moments as they're termed and that and I I, I you know I, I always challenge that myself I think it's about communicating more generally um, and then being inclusive more generally I think if we're really truly committed to inclusion um, then we need to be in, empowering people enabling people to work in whatever way that they find find best um, so I think it's yeah it, it comes down it comes down to that not being complacent um, senior lead the role of senior leaders and representation as Rebecca said I was going to mention that as well I think that's key um, but yeah I, th I think those 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 are the things that I've mentioned just keep keep pushing on and um, not being complacent that uh, everything's now okay absolutely thank you very much James I think that is that is the one of the issues here uh, but, you know in the, in the COVID post COVID environment is that uh, idea of just trying to get back to the past uh, as opposed to building for the future. Uh, and that, that was the uh, title of our, uh, one of our events at one of our very beginning events uh, was building back better. Uh, and uh, that's uh, really, uh, that's, uh, we, we've, I think we have lost sight of that, uh, which is quite unfortunate. So I think that's a very good point. Okay, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, uh, Jared, uh, Gallagher in Trinity College Dublin, Rebecca Maguire in uh, Minute University, Deirdre O'Connor in UCD. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and of course, James Hill in Cranfield University. Uh, I'd like to thank you all today for uh, participating in the panel discussion. And it was really interesting to hear your point of view. Um, we're going to move on now to uh, the um, breakout rooms next. So I, I'm going to bring uh, our event today to a close. But before I do that, again, I'd like to thank uh, all of the people that have supported uh, the organizing of the event and the whole team. Uh, that I would also uh, just let you know that we're going to collate uh, all of the information, our keynote, our panel discussion, some of the, re the rec our recommendations made here through the panel discussion and go to put or the breakout rooms. And then we're going to produce a, a small little report, uh, which we hope to launch around the International Week for Disabled People, uh, which is around the last week of November, first week of December. Uh, and that uh, we will invite all of you to, to that uh, launch. And obviously we'll send you all a copy of as well. Um, so if anybody has anything that, uh, that comes to them after the event, we'd please do get in contact. And we really do hope you found it useful. Uh, and thank you all uh, for coming and we enjoyed uh, your company today. Uh, so at, at this point, I'm going to uh, stop the recording and... Uh, uh...